Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Benoit Leroy, uh, the CEO of the South African Water Chamber. Um, I'll be your host today. Bridget is our desk jockey, sound engineer, picture engineer in the background. Um, and today we, we've got two, two topics. We advertised one topic. Uh, we've got two topics. Uh, the first one we're going to, and the second topic is we'll touch near the end on the situation in KZN. Uh, which is which is quite tragic and um we just need to to cover a few things and and share share a few with our eminent guests uh we have the usual panel with us we have professor anthony turton that you know very well uh professor hamanth kassan and we have um fred's the other gentleman like me we are mister and uh, uh we have uh, fred platt with us and I'm, I'm proud to say that um that's just about the entire water chamber uh, steering committee too, which we've we've bolstered up uh, quite nicely. Um, so today, I, I think we need to look at we we are unfortunately looking at at at, at what, what I think it's bad news, but the good news side is that um, you know the the whole truth and nothing but the truth has been tabled, and it's been quite a few years since uh, th that's happened in such a visible manner. I think it's 2013 or 14. Uh, since this this self-reporting uh, system was 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 actually published, and um, there's 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 actually you know one needs to know what we're dealing with to be able to to solve it. There's four critical areas um, that they look at in these in these uh, reports. So one is the treatment capacity, the other one is water quality, uh, technical skills, and uh, water safety planning. So it's not just the outputs of, uh, let's say, uh, the, the the potable water and the sewage. It's also looking at, you know, how sustainable is the, you know, is the operation. Um, we have 144 water service authorities and 1186, 1,186 uh, water supply systems in there, and um, only 40% of these systems achieve blue drop uh, status, and that's that's 90 90%. So. Uh, that doesn't paint for, for, for a good picture, but uh, Hamant, you're, you're the, the water quality specialist. Um, what is your read um, uh, on, on the blue drop, uh, on, the, on the microbiological uh, side of things, and, um, and anything else that you think sticks out that we really need to discuss? Thanks. Um, appreciate it, Benoit, the opportunity, and uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, look, as a uh, as a trained microbiologist, uh, you ask me a difficult question, but let me answer it in the following way: the the microbiological quality and the extent to which we're monitoring the microbiological quality is a huge concern. We don't know what we don't know if we don't monitor. The great thing about science is it's all about the truth, and so these reports, which have really been done very well, I must say and all of the detailed 500 odd pages of each of the two reports illustrate to us clearly that we have some serious challenges when it comes to both the blue drop and the green drop. And in particular, the question that you asked me in terms of the microbiological quality of the water, the huge concern is the notion that we're not testing enough because the more we test, the more data we can acquire and the more facts we acquire and a better picture emerges of what the situation is. The last thing you want as a water service provider, either at the utility level, bulk water uh, level, or at the municipal level, what you really don't want is a microbiological problem. You don't want an E. coli or a Salmonella typhi or a Cryptosporidium parasite or Jaja parasite which comes through the water, that will have very serious consequences. If you take a big water utility like Ran Water, which has 16 million consumers, okay, should you have a problem of water quality, this will impact the province in a way we've never imagined before. It is, it is something even more impactful than the COVID disease because you can't stop it once the water is released People get sick, they get diarrhea, dysentery, you need intravenous drips, you need to ensure that you have sufficient drips, sufficient hospital beds. This is not a small problem. The impact of this can be of proportion magnitude. 
We've seen this happen in Australia. We've seen this happen in in in, in many cities in the U.S. Uh, not too long ago, we've seen it happen in in Michigan, uh, where you would have heard of the lead poisoning. Uh, we've had Jaja cryptosporidium outbreaks in Australia about 20 years ago. Uh, at that time, the entire executive of the water utility uh, had to vacate their jobs because the impact was so great on the health system, on the public health. And then they also had to call in specialists from all over the world to look at how you can overcome such a situation. So no, the news is not good, but I'd like to, 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 to say on a positive note, that the science has clearly indicated that we have a good indication of the size of the problem. The issue now becomes how we go about addressing this problem, particularly in the face of the challenge we have in South Africa, which is that the, the responsibility for, for ensuring good water quality provision and also the, the maintenance of the, the infrastructure when it comes to wastewater treatment works is in the, ha in the hands of third tier government. This is a function of the municipalities. And we are well aware of the acute challenges that the municipalities are facing. So I think we need to get innovative. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves and we're going to have to fix this problem as South Africans so that we can once again be proud of the quality of water and for people to have public confidence to drink the water with no concern whatsoever. I should add very quickly also that the standard that is used when it comes to water quality is the South African National Standard 241, right? Now, this is a South African standard, and this is the minimum standard that the water needs to meet. This is very different from the World Health Organization guideline. That should be the aspirational guideline for countries, right? That's why it's not a standard, it's a guideline. So the SNS standard is the minimum for South Africa but whilst I would have thought that we would like to be aspiring to the WHO guideline, clearly we have some serious work to do, even to comply to the SANA standard in terms of improving the public confidence of drinking water. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. You bring up a good point. So we're in the third league at the moment and we're struggling with those standards. And we've got the World Health Standard. I, I wasn't aware that uh, we're... We're so far off that. Um, Tony, your, your, your take on the situation? Blue, green, um, or either or both? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, once again, I like to I like to be positive about these things and, and factual. I think the good news, let's start with the good news. The good news is the fact that we have a new minister in place who has made a decision to, uh, to do his best under very difficult circumstances to try and reinstate public confidence by uh, issuing these blue and green drop reports. You must remember that uh, Nomvula Mokanyani made the decision uh, to suspend the reports because the news was so bad. So the current minister knew that the news is bad, but he said, well, let's rather confront this and uh, let's, let's, let's at least start to build up confidence and, uh, and know what we're dealing with. So when you, when you don't know what you don't know, then you are really in serious, serious problems, as, uh, as Amans has said. And now we're starting to know what it is that we don't know. And it is, it is very concerning that your, your microbiological parameters are starting to become a factor because there are quite serious consequences, as, as Hamant has explained. Uh, I, I think you know, we, we can explore that a lot further. But uh, you know, I must appreciate that we just recently had a, had a news of a potential outbreak um, that was announced by the uh, National Institute of Communicable Diseases. Um, that is that is quite a serious uh, serious issue. Ty they were talking about typhoid typhoid outbreak, and a typhoid is associated with uh, you know with underdevelopment and backwardness, and it's really not associated in any way with uh, with a modern industrial economy. So when you start talking about things like that, we are, these are little red flags that are that are getting more and more prominent. And I think ultimately the fact that uh, that the um, the overall responsibility for this is at the first year of government, the municipal level of government, which is also where we are weakest in South Africa. We are having systemic failure across the municipalities. We all know about that from, from a number of different uh, conversations we have about it. So the, the fact that uh, what we're achieving something like 60% uh, compliance, this is just really not, that means 40% non-profit. Am I right, Benoit? Is that the number we're talking about? 40% compliance. So we have more who are not complying. Uh, okay, so... So we have 40% compliance, 60% non-compliance, 60%. And, 
and we have over a thousand of these water treatment plants, etc. That's a that shows systemic widespread problems, and I think it also starts opening up the uh, the conversation about governance and oversight, which we've uh, discussed uh, on, on this program before, uh, by the regulatory uh, function. Um, I think that's an important issue. But there's another sub-issue that, uh, that we can also perhaps open up in this conversation today, and that is the issue on, uh, of, uh, of supply chain management for some of your key ingredients that go into water processing. I'm talking now particularly about your disinfectants, about chlorine, for example, because I know that that's an important aspect as well. And uh, I don't know if we're going to have time and, and place today to, to discuss that, but I think that is something that's of national importance. So, uh, so over, over, overall, I'm in, uh, very, very impressed the fact, by the fact that the minister has decided to face, you know, to face the music and bite the bullet. We must support him in that. But now we also have to say, what are we going to do uh, going forward? Because clearly, I don't, I don't believe that the first-year government municipalities, I don't believe that they actually have the capacity in them to turn the ship around. They're going to need assistance externally from somewhere. And I, you know, this is something we've got to apply more to. Back to you. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, just to try and pin that, 27% uh, of our 1,186 water supply systems have sufficient classified operators, less than a third. Um, so, you know, it's trying to race Formula One without a driver. We will give, we'll, we'll give drivers to a third of the cars, you know, and see who finishes. Um, that's really we at. Fred, from, from, your, from your perspective, from, from a business perspective, um, you, you know, there's, there's a flip side to, to challenges and problems that we have. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I smell, op apart from some foul water, I smell opportunities here. Uh, what, what's your take? You're on mute there, Fred. Apologies. Thanks. I, I think the the first thing is that, um, you know, putting your head in the sand doesn't let the problem go away. Um, so the first stage of, of, of recovery, whether it is from an addiction or whether it is turning a business around, is the recognition of the extent of the problem, being able to, to stand up and say, yeah, we have a problem publicly, um, and then to be able to engage with that. Now, um, like any other business problem, uh, the bottom line is that you've you've got to look at what is your capacity, you've got to understand your ability to, to fund, and then you've got to look and say, you know, what skills do we have in-house? What are we missing? What partnerships do we need to form? And how do we put an effective management and governance structure in place within which we can we can turn this around? From the business sector perspective, obviously it, it creates an incredible opportunity um, to, to really make a meaningful difference in terms of turning these problems into opportunities, um, taking uh, hands with government and, and really just ensuring that we, we start at a point and we start working through this. The, from the business chamber perspective, obviously what, what we identified very early uh, was the three areas, you know, the policy certainty, regulatory certainty, and then a, a contracting framework. Um, so I think this provides us with the, the first two, I think, have been dealt with and are in the process of being rolling out. But what we need to find now is how do we look at, we understand the problem. The problem's well-defined. We have a lack of capacity. Um, it's showing up in, in the reports. And the question is now, what is that framework where we can bring the best of, of breed from private and public together? And how do we then harness that energy in order to start somewhere, turn it around, build a model, which we can then replicate throughout the country? Thanks, Fred. So, so you know, um, we've got a question there. What do you think we can do to, to ensure compliance? And I think what you're talking to is, is what you've heard from our two eminent academics is 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 um we have an issue at least we're reporting it we're not sweeping it under the carpet and yes and and the water chamber is being set up to uh, catalyze the um collaboration between the public and private sector and I, i'll talk about the private sector on the green drop side but um we have a flip side there not on the water i couldn't find it but on on the green drop where we have um uh, uh, most of the 
the, the, the systems on the private side actually complying uh, a green drop status. So um, it's, it, it really reinforces that the private sector needs to be engaged, doesn't necessarily have everything, but I think one and one will, will, soon, get, will soon get to three. Um, but, you know, the, the big issue at the moment is that um, we haven't, because we haven't had the reports uh, for, what's it, seven, eight, nine years, um, so, so it's, it's a decade if you round it up. Um, we, we, we've allowed local government to actually shirk their responsibilities. So, I mean, we're paying the group of us and industry and the likes and commerce and shopping centers and, and the, the city dwellers, we're paying for our water, uh, but you're giving us this, this, this non-compliant um, uh, service. So the big question is, is, is how do we enforce? And, you know, we've seen reluctance um, from government, uh, from national government to actually enforce legislation where municipal managers who are the accounting officers would be uh, uh, criminally um, charged or civilly charged uh, for, you know, you know, for damage, damage. But to me, that's the last resort. Uh, we, we, need, we need to really start, you know, fixing the thing. So I, I, th I think we need to start looking at special purpose vehicles, for example, to, to, to ring fence and to, to change the legislation that the revenue that comes from water services is ring fenced within local government that it is only spent for uh, uh, you know, water and services. And let's say 5 or 10% goes into running the municipality from a management fee perspective. Um, you know, th that would, would go a long way uh, and, and, and make it illegal for funds that are raised for electricity, not to be used electricity, water for water and all the likes. But can you imagine 27% of the operators are classified? That is blatantly illegal, you know, because... Your, your permits for your plants, so your water use licenses, your, your EIAs, and uh, your operating permits, uh, including Department of Labor, are all based on having the right people in the right places. So, um, you know, how long can these unqualified people run, run these systems for? I don't think, you know, you know, you know too long. Um, if we move on to, you know, on, on to the green drop, and I think that's where the number of 8 billion rand was, was, was put onto the table, that, and, and, and local government is really running, uh, you know, the sewage works. There's 995 of them that, that were actually, um, you know, audited. So that's, that's nearly, I think it's just below 1,100, all, all, you know, all told. So, you know, the majority were audited. And if you have a look at it, 2% got 90 percent so the green drop now now that's not a sans 241 that's a general standard or a special standard so if you had to look at if the world health or the rwa had an equivalent standard that would mean that we probably have 100 percent failure so we meet we, we meet no acceptable uh, norm and uh, i mean it's not a difficult calculation or assumption to to actually make um but you know so Two percent got ninety ninety percent uh, um, uh, green drop. Now in the private sector, three percent did not get. So ninety seven percent got. I was unaware that the private sector was also. Um, when they say the private sector, it's the non local government. So it includes Sassel, Eskom, uh, Sun City, uh, Sandpox. Um, I mean, you know, Eskom and Sandpox are SOEs. But those achieved a ninety seven percent green drop. It's not many works, 30 of them, but 97%. Does, does that not show that the private sector is on its game and government is not off its game? Um, Fred, if you can go back to you, we go counterclockwise. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, what we've got to do is we've got to celebrate um, centers of excellence and we've got to learn from them and see what they're doing right and how do we transfer that. I think another point is, you know, how often, if, if we're going to manage this, um, what level of information is available at what intervals? It, it's wonderful to get the green and blue drop report from time to time, but the, the risks don't go away. The management doesn't go away. So the, the, the level of information that we have, the, the, the transparency of that information, the access to that information that the general public has, um, is critical on a day-to-day. -day. I mean, we live in an environment and in, in an uh, a era in which information is, is, is given by the minute, not by the year. 
Um, so for me, two things. The one is, let's have a look. Let's see what's happening both locally and internationally. We are networked internationally. We have access to, um, to the best in the world. Um, we've got wonderful, wonderful skills locally, and we've got experience locally. And then, as you've mentioned, there are, there are examples that are working. Um, and, and so we need to look at, at, at best of breed in the public sector, private sector. We need to bring it all together, and we collectively need to make a model that says this is how we roll it out. This is how we work. And then you can't manage what you can't measure. So how do we measure this? How do we continually uh, you know, have access to that information? I think what, what we're dealing with now is we understand the extent of the problem. Um, it's, it's highlighted, and we need to use this momentum um, to, to really look at what is working, what isn't working, and how do we put the, what is working together um, from, from both private and public and, and, and put a model forward that can work. Yeah, I, I think you raise really good points. And also what you're saying is we need, uh, we don't need this annual dashboard. We need a live dashboard. So, you know, whilst we're racing that car, can you imagine you get that dashboard at the end of each lap as you go past the pits? We give you a snippet mm -hmm. of your speed, your FK and how much fuel you got left. Um, it's not going to last, uh, t you, know, you know, too long. So, and, and we do have a lot of the, let's say, the, the, the measurement devices in the field and we do have a lot of... Um, telemetry in the field and all the likes. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a matter of embracing the fourth industrial revolution. Um, uh, uh, Tony, from, from your perspective there, uh, do, do, do you, I mean, the mines are also part, you know, part of this. I know you've had quite a lot of exposure there, but uh, do, do you see the private sector being uh, you know, a big factor? Because we, have, we don't seem to hear that the private sector is battling with its sewage works and its water systems and the likes. Generally speaking, those are relatively efficient. This underpins it, but the sample is, is pretty small. What do you think? Look, uh, I think we can't deny the fact that we're living in the era of the metaverse. And the metaverse is an important place because it's a digital, uh, digital world around us of real data, big data, real-time data. Uh, I mean, I'm involved in a project where we're capturing data from over a thousand sensors in one plant uh, in real time at the other, other side of the planet, and we're processing that, and, and we're pre 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 predicting an hour in advance what's going to happen mm -hmm. to the plant ability. So the, the, the era of big data is upon us, and I would like to think that one of the things that needs to come on the, on the agenda at national level when we talk about rehabilitation of the water sector is this whole idea of big data. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the Department of Water and Sanitation needs to have access to, uh, to this, this big data platform where every single uh, 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 processing plant in the country is, uh, is, is connected by means of uh, real-time sensors. Uh, this, this technology is, is almost mainstream now. It's not even uh, 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 cutting edge anymore. It's, uh, it's almost normal. So uh, to me, it's unforgivable. And the other question that uh, is raised by uh, the fact that we, we don't have qualified operators in about a third of the plant, that is unforgivable in many ways. That, uh, unfortunately, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, take aim at any individual or any organization, but I must, I must just uh, state categorically that we have in South Africa a very sophisticated water sector and different components of the water sector have got institutions that look after their interests. And one of the important institutions is WISA, the Water Institute of Southern Africa. And one of their core mandates, in fact, is to is to train operators and to and to uh, look after after the operators. So uh, I would say that they've got a, a challenge on their hand. Uh, they've probably got their own uh, their own shortcomings and uh, own uh, issues to deal with. But uh, clearly, uh, there's one third of the operators that, that that are not qualified. This is something that uh, they ought to uh, be given uh, with, uh, as a priority with some uh, sense of urgency. But uh, you know, just to close off, I, I cannot see how we and really seriously think about moving forward with any sustained economic development in this country without thinking about this big data stuff. I mean, the metaverse, the, the metaverse is, is with us and uh, we just have to really start seriously thinking about that because the opportunity cost of not doing that is just too great. And so we're never ever going to get back into the first league uh, when you were talking early on about the third league versus the first league. We're never going to get back in that first league. And let's rather aim high, let's aspire 
to be good. Let's aspire to be excellent. There's nothing wrong with that. That's healthy. That's not unhealthy. Back to you. No, thanks. It's it's two thirds of the operators are are not uh, classified. Two thirds. Well, Linda, can I just can I just add to that? So, so in other words, it's like it's like a, a, a municipal bus service because uh, really it's a public service. Water services are like it's a public good. It's a public service. So it's like a municipal bus service or a, or a metro train service where two thirds of the train drivers or two thirds of the bus drivers are not qualified. I mean, I mean, this is this is laughable. It's actually, you know, it, it, I mean, it is it is so absurd that it, that that, it, that it's not even in in my framework of rational thinking. How can you how can you realistically believe that your gate can govern a country when you know, when you can't provide these fundamental services and two thirds of the people are unqualified? I mean, this is just a, a giant red flag. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I'm quite outraged by that. And uh, and uh, I'm not going to remain silent anymore in my outrage about that because I just think it's unacceptable. We're paying rates and taxes for, and we say we've got an expectation of reasonable services, and we've got incompetent people driving the ship. To me, that is simply unacceptable. I, I, I agree. And uh, you, you know, Hamant, uh, your experience having worked for Rand Water for, for, I think, 22 years and the likes is. Um, my, my feeling is that the, 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 the water utilities, the water producers, by and large, especially the large ones, are quite well capacitated. Am, am, am I right in, um, in, in making that assumption? Well, let me, let me address that issue like this, Panoy. You see, the, the, the bulk water service providers like Red Water, Amgeni Water, Sadi Bang Water, any others, they Essentially, their function is to produce water up to saying 0241 and pass it on as the wholesaler to the retailer who's the municipality. Now, once that water enters the municipal network across the meter, remember, prior to it arriving to your house through the municipal reticulation network, the question is what's happening to that water in that system? And that's what this data is showing. So this data is per municipal system. So it's showing you the quality of the water there on the one hand. On the other hand, whilst these two reports were released separately, which is correct, we must remember that each of these two reports are two sides of the same coin. The blue drop is drinking water and the green drop is the wastewater. Now, given the sad state of affairs with the wastewater, the green drop. Fundamentally, what this means is you're polluting the environment. Now, that same environment is where downstream you draw water, put it through an expensive water processing system in order to purify it. All that will happen if this situation continues is the cost of water treatment will go up because we know that we can treat any quality of water, but it comes at a price. The more polluted, the more it costs you. So the cost of water treatment will go up. In addition, where is the fundamental problem? The fundamental problem has been well defined. It's in the operations and management space, amongst other things like governance, management, leadership, etc. right? Operations and management of each of these plants that are shown not to be performing as they should is a problem. Now, the world has demonstrated that there are private sector operations and maintenance companies. These plans can be done with public private partnerships to enhance the operations and, and management of these plants. The notion of going the big data route, yes. Indeed, that's not even innovative anymore, as Anthony said. You know, that's par for the course in many countries. They have real time data in terms of the monitoring systems. But in developing countries, one needs to be cautious to the extent that we need to understand that technology is an enabler. If you put in a system very quickly that monitors every system in this country and gives you real time the data that somebody is monitoring, you would like to believe that that monitoring system will lead to action, the action of remediating the problem. This is not necessarily true. So whilst you may have a lot of big data, it will just redefine the problem more clearly for you and tell you exactly how much is wrong by the minute 
unless you have the appropriate systems in place to fix it. So the two go hand in hand. And I think that herein lies, you know, an opportunity. Whilst this is a huge challenge and whilst we could spend a lot of time talking about the fact that these systems have deteriorated over the last 15, 20 years, it's clear from the previous reports that the, the, the extent of water supply and, and sanitation provision and the operation of these systems has deteriorated. Now, going forward, I think it's a marvelous opportunity for all of the stakeholders put, to put their heads together. Yes, it appears that the minister is keen, he's indicated these are the brutal facts. Something has to be done. Now it's time for private sector, public sector, uh, SOEs, and all of the expertise to innovate a plan, a plan that will be sustainable in overcoming the challenge despite changes in political leadership. And this is critical. When you're dealing with water and sanitation, political changes cannot lead to erratic changes in strategy. You need to have a coherent strategy for a long term, and that strategy, you need to subscribe to it in order to see the results on a sustainable basis. So that would be my view in terms of how we should proceed in addressing this for the country going forward. Thanks, Alan. So what, you, what you're saying, and I heard a lot of this um, from, from the political side of things at the Water Summit, um, recently was to depoliticize uh, our water services. So I, th I, th I think that's been acknowledged. I think it's quite difficult, um, but I, I think it's, it, it's, it's a very possible thing. So that, you know, from ministers might change, but DG and down, they are on contract for five years and that's what it is. And the contract can be extended once. And those people should not be subjected to any, um, any political uh, machinations um, at all. Uh, I think, that's the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, it always seems to knock in my head, is that the um, uh, government through Stats SA uh, said recently that only 59, no, uh, for 59 percent of households do not pay for, you know, pay for water. So the question comes, um, is there enough um, uh, money in the system to, to lubricate it um, with uh, most people not actually paying for, for their water services? Uh, well, you know, Hamad, what have you seen in the rest of the world? Because yeah. I'm told the only one is 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 Ireland the, in the developed world where where water is free, but you've got a different situation. The fiscus is well lubricated. Well, remember the reality on the ground uh, that we're not talking to is these reports talk about quality, right? The quality of the affluent coming out of wastewater works on the one hand, on on the other hand, the quality of your drinking potable water. Now, we are concerned now that the quality of the water in many instances is not up to speed as per SN0241. But remember, there's the flip side again of the coin, the quantity. Already we know in South Africa that on an average we're losing 35% of, of what we used to think was good quality water. Okay? Now we know it's not all good quality water. Okay. However, we're losing 35% that the consumer is paying for. Now, the consumer is not only paying for this quantity of water they do not receive. In addition, the consumer is now paying for water that's not of the right quality standard. So here we find really a challenge that needs to be overcome quickly and simultaneously. You need to arrest the leaks because that's why we're losing the water. In arresting the leaks, you will free up the funds. And guess what? The silver bullet in all of this is if you repair the leaks, it's very hard to go from 35 to zero or to five, but we know the world can easily take us technologically from 35 to 15. Now that 35 to 15 will obviate the need for infrastructure in the future. Now, you have recently heard announcements that some utilities will be spending many billions of rands in the next five years in terms of augmenting infrastructure for water supply. All of this augmentation, or much of it, is necessary in the face of the water that is leaking. If you can reduce that substantially, you will not need to spend all of these billions of rands in augmenting more infrastructure for you to supply water. So we're in that situation where you don't have the luxury to approach one issue at the time. You need to manage this tackle. Uh, you need to tackle this, this elephant from all sides at the same time now. And that's where we have to go. 
So it's what what you're saying is it's it it's a complex um, it, it's a complex issue, and it requires uh, multiple streams uh, simultaneously to hit it, and we've been unable to do it in its own silo. So it's this is Premier League stuff, and uh, we yeah. need to put our heads our heads together to to actually do that. Um, Fred, do you think we can? You're, you're on mute still, Fred. Sorry. Sorry. While uh, while Hamad was speaking, you know, I was kind of thinking from a um, a dysfunctional business perspective. When you when you look at uh, the business, you've got to look at it multifaceted. You've got to understand the layers, the nuances. You've got to understand all, all of that. You've also got to say, where do I give my attention first? Where with the least effort, I get the the biggest return. Um, and and also, you know, we can't even speak about the infrastructure side of the investment if we if we don't address the leaks, if we don't address the issue of of non revenue water, whether it leak or leaks or non payment. Um, but I think the other critical component is that, you know, a mediocre plan well implemented will always outperform a brilliant plan that that is not implemented. Um, and, and, and so the, the message really is we've got to get going. Uh, we've got to start implementing. We've got to start working. We, we may not have all of the answers. So, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, can we solve all of these problems? My, my simple answer is if we start, we can. Um, and as we start, we will learn, we will build capacity. I think we spend a lot of time defining the problem. We define why we can't do it. We look at, at the, um, the funding shortfall. We look at the skill shortfall. We look at the political uh, challenges that we face. We look at the uh, constitutional and legislative framework. And, and we spend so much time in there. And I think we need to shift our mind following this uh, green and blue drop report to say, where do we start? Who do we put together? Where do we start? Let's, let's you know, take the problems one by one um, and let's look at that, that layered and nuanced challenges that we face and let's put a plan in place in conjunction with the best people we have and, and then start on this journey. Um, and, and, and we will gain momentum, we will gain the necessary experience, and we will attract the right skills, and we will do lots of other things um, downstream. And the impact we know, the multiplier effect in the economy, not only enabling the economy, which is now currently restrained, um, you know, we're facing two major problems. The one is we're fa facing this issue of, of, of restraining the economy. And on the other hand, we, we face this issue of, of, of a lack of human dignity. Um, and together, we need to bring those two together, but, but we got to start somewhere. So we, we have to start. And unfortunately, we've had this uh, catastrophe of, of, of heavy floods that started in, in KZN. And um, whilst we've got a bit of time left, just wanted to, to touch on that. It's very unfortunate. I mean, the death toll is at 253 as of about two, you know, two hours ago. Yesterday, I think it was it was 30 or 40. I mean, every soul counts. And um, it's, it's, it's actually incredible, the pictures that are coming through. Tony, you, you're, you're based in KZN, so you, you know, you're, you're in the middle of it. And um, what's, your, what, what's your take of, of where we're at? And, and there's this other cell moving in that might hit us... Um, because there's a lot of rain forecast this weekend, not only in KZN, but also inland where we are. Tony? Yes, uh, look, we are certainly being, uh, being pummeled in KZN by various things. Uh, as remember, it was only uh, July last year that we were uh, engulfed in flames with the, uh, the rioting associated with uh, Jacob Zuma's uh, prison time. And uh, now we've got this uh, severe, severe flooding. I mean, absolutely severe flooding. Um, I've just been reporting today on the Shongwezi Dam that uh, where two of the sluice gates have tripped today, they've uh, they automatically tripped to prevent uh, uh, the, the, the wall from failing. So uh, that's upstream of the Sapref oil refinery. And if you look right next door to it is Toyota South Africa uh, plant uh, that's been underwater. So Toyota uh, 
production has been severely disrupted. And in fact, I've just received a, a notification while we're on air now that uh, the oil supply uh, in, in, in the region is going to be disrupted now as a result of, uh, of your, your various uh, infrastructure problems from roads to pipes to pumps to, you know, to do actual refinery. So uh, we are seeing a, a, a complex uh, multiplier effect. And on top of this, uh, the irony, irony is that uh, while we've got tons of water flowing everywhere, and you know, bridges collapsing and, and, uh, and people washing out to sea and tankers being washed out to sea, at the same time, uh, there are large parts of KZN, uh, Durban included, that has got erratic water supply or no water supply. Um, so uh, you know, these things are, are all infrastructure related and, uh, and uh, we, are, we are being hit by one crisis after the other. And I like to think of, of infrastructure as the critical element that buffers a society from crisis. Uh, in other words, if we didn't have infrastructure, we wouldn't be buffered from the vagaries of nature. And therefore, we would, we would just con continue to live under a state of nature, which means uh, life is short, brutish and harsh. Uh, so we don't, we don't want to go back to that. We need to uh, get our infrastructure in place. But uh, various uh, various elements of the uh, infrastructure are severely damaged. Uh, in fact, I've never in my life seen the ocean the way it is. Where you know normally after a storm in KZN you see this dirty muddy water going out to ocean, and it's normally you get this line of dirty water. Then you get the, you get the clear blue sea behind that. Literally now, as far as I can see, I, I can see up to the horizon from my house, and uh, literally up to the horizon we've now got brown muddy water from. This is all of the topsoil. This is the prime topsoil of the province that's also washing away. So this is uh, we are seeing the you know, ultimately the loss of, uh, of, of 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 agricultural productivity uh, as well. So it's a very very debilitating thing. And I might also add that there's just one more element about this, and that is that um, in the writing this uh, this last July we 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 uh, had this one specific incident when uh, a a toxic uh, uh, a chemical company, a hazardous chemical company called UPL, uh, uh, was allowed to have a massive storage facility uh, in a residential area close to schools and close to high density populations, and uh, that uh, that failed in the in the rioting and and and, and, and uh, the firefighters now uh, uh, re released uh, um, uh, water onto the f flames and all of that flooded down into the river. Uh, and uh, that uh, has now released it's an incredible amount of toxin, uh, tons and tons of, 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 of complex toxic compounds uh, into the environment. And that will probably persist for uh, at least a decade, if not a generation. And now on top of that, we're seeing infrastructure failure and particularly we're seeing failure of, uh, of buildings, which suggests that building codes and authorizations and environmental impact assessments and all of those kind of paperwork things have been short-circuited or not done properly. So once again, it speaks to the possibility of, uh, of corruption uh, raising its head where developers can, can get away with doing stuff that otherwise would not normally be, uh, be acceptable. So I'm afraid KZN right now is uh, really the epicenter of crisis upon crisis, one after the other. Um. <laughs> You know, Hamant, I saw um, uh, a note early on today with with some um, uh, bulk water supply being being interrupted, and and those lines are sometimes up to three four meters in diameter. Um, if you've got those sort of interruptions, where um, bulk lines supplying Etequeni and others that Amgani supplies um, uh, fairly far down and up the coast, if those lines are disrupted, uh, do 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 you have any idea how long it would take once you can move in and do the work to actually fix them? Because I think they're normally con concrete, um, the, these big bulk lines. Would you have any any idea on that? You're on, you're on mute, uh, Hamad. Hamad, you're on mute. There you go. Excellent. Apologies. Yes, those pipelines, are, some of them are concrete, but primarily we use steel pipelines in this country. It takes time to rehabilitate. You can imagine one, two, you know, the unexpected crisis, the disaster response becomes very important. And uh, again, you know, <laughs> as scientists, this whole notion of climate change, we've been aware of it for some time now. And our ability to plan, mitigate, adaptation actions, you know, risk management, etc. 
now shows his head when you have these sorts of disasters. And, and this has been the experience of many countries that have experienced such floods and also droughts on not on an, you know, uh, once off basis, but on a repeated basis, your ability to be able to respond in a disaster and rehabilitate your infrastructure quickly so that, you know, citizens and, and, and people out there get the water flow going and that they had comfort that the quality of water is good and that the electricity supply is in order becomes very, very critical. It's really, really sad what has happened in KZN. Of course, uh, you know, as, as Anthony has said, some of the properties that, that have been destroyed, it's questionable whether they met the, the building codes and all of that will come out in the wash, no doubt. There's no doubt that that will come out in the wash. But I think that the, the future is going to be nothing like that. Unfortunately, the future is not going to be anything like the past. So like we had the COVID pandemic, you know, and at one time the Japanese were really advocating the philosophy of just in time, right? That you should build infrastructure just in time. You shouldn't build it ahead of time because you're wasting resources and it's not effective and it's not efficient. Well, guess what the COVID taught us about infrastructure and particularly water infrastructure in the world? COVID taught us that you should build just in case rather than just in time. So herein lies a whole new philosophical way of thinking for us to face the future um, during crises like this. For now, we need to get over the, the urgency and get the systems running. And then I think that you need to relook planning into the future to ensure that when you have such occurrences, that you have the capability, the capacity to supply uh, without a serious problem. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, I like that terminology. Um, it's the first time I, I hear it. I don't know where I've been hiding it. Just in case, as opposed to, because we all talk just in time from our Japanese uh, mass producers. The just in case, I think, is, is good. And um, I, I suppose it's like pro providing on the balance sheet for, for a rainy day, as we do in business very often. And sometimes we have to, if you're the land for business, you could provide for remediation, the mining for mine closure and all the likes. Um, I think, yeah, we need to, to start having some infrastructure in place, uh, in case and in place, um, because yeah, the vagaries of nature induced by, you know, by many things and with population that's increased a lot. So we have a lot more people that could, you know, that could be affected. So Fred, I, I, I think out of this misery that we've seen happening in KZN, I, I think uh, we see from a business perspective, definitely with, with uh, there's going to be a big rebuilding that has to happen and we have to do it right this time and um, at the right price and make sure that the emergency supply chains are extremely well governed. And um, maybe we need to get you know some of the judiciary involved to oversee this to make sure that um, we do it right and on time and uh, everybody gets what they need to do. Fred? Yeah. I think the um, the important thing is that um, you know business needs to reach out, um, be there, and 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 engage on on how do we rebuild um, not only the the country but specifically regions like uh, like KZN. Um, and I think what what Amant was talking about uh, the just in case is that we have to decouple our infrastructure planning and our, our approach to infrastructure uh, development from the political cycles um, of your five-year cycles or whatever and 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 really start looking at uh, you know how do we rejuvenate the economy how do we address the the immediate issues um, and then how do we put a plan in place that starts saying how how do we ensure that we're resilient um, and able to face the challenges that as they come, be they economic, be they uh, environmental, be they from, uh, you know, from a, uh, a population or a demographic movement perspective. Um, and those are all critical, critical components that we need to take into account when planning and, 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 and from business's perspective, I think we are in a position to provide the tools with which government can engage constructively with these challenges. And then, of course, we want to be there to be government's execution partner 
in ensuring you spoke about doing projects on time within budget, um, looking at the affordability, looking at value for money, um, looking at ensuring that uh, that we have delivery, all of those governance issues. Um, and governance is not only an issue for for um, for for government. We know that there's. Uh, uh, governance issues within the private sector and within government. And for that reason, we need to agree a governance framework for addressing these issues that is flexible enough to ensure delivery, but robust enough to ensure that the, the proper governance, uh, that proper governance is achieved. So I agree. So what's good for the goose is good, good for the gander. So it has to be, you know, equitable. And I, I see an element of this because in the green drop, they started to include non-government um, um, sites. So I, I agree with that. Um, thanks, Fred. So that, that, that's pretty positive from that perspective. Um, uh, closing comments from your side, Anthony? Yeah, I think uh, you know, you know, what we've heard today is uh, a couple of very important concepts. The first thing is that uh, water quality in the country is absolutely definitely deteriorating. Both uh, wastewater and uh, and uh, potable water, and this is a, a, a great, great, a great concern. We've also touched base on the fact that uh, the the, the country is being buffered or buffeted by all kinds of climatological uh, monstrosities that are hitting us. So I think the name of the game is going to be in future rejuvenation. We're going to have to rejuvenate our economy and rejuvenate our infrastructure and uh, renewal. And uh, part of that is we're going to start uh, uncoupling. We're going to have to start increasingly uncouple uh, the uh, the economy from the vagaries of nature because just as uh, we're now having lots and lots of rain and lots and lots of uh, storms, uh, in the not too distant future, we might well be uh, having very, very extreme droughts of the same magnitude but on the opposite end of the scale. So uh, we're going to have to seriously revisit. In fact, we are obliged now. Our infrastructure is so broken that we are obliged to revisit it. And in the process of revisiting it, I think we're going to start uh, looking at new business models. And uh, the decoupling thing, uh, I think, is going to start opening up the case either for, for, for public-private uh, uh, participation. I think there's well, that's almost a, a foregone conclusion. And I think the other thing is you're going to start seeing water recycling and recovery plant in the PPP model, uh, particularly of uh, recycling wastewater, but also the recovery of water from the oceans, uh, uh, large utility-scale desalination plants are generally new water. So uh, if, if there are any green shoots in this crisis, I think those are the green shoots that, that this is going to simply push us over the edge into that new space where, where we have to rebuild. And so therefore, let's rebuild best of breed, not, uh, not third rate anymore. Back to you. I agree. Thanks a lot there, Tony. Um, Hamanth, from your side in closing? Yes, I'd like to address the, the question that, that came up earlier I saw on the screen and I think that the person was asking what is what can they do in, in terms of a water service institution to, to ensure good water quality and service delivery? Well, my short answer to that would be when it comes to drinking water, it's fundamental to ensure that your chlorination or other disinfection method that you're using is working 24 seven. Disinfection is a very powerful and proven method to kill microorganisms. So if we exercise proper vigilance on ensuring that we disinfect our water properly all the time, then we will mitigate that microbiological problem. Even if we don't see a drastic increase in the monitoring of microorganisms, we can be assured that the disinfectant will kill the microorganisms. And finally, then, uh, some last words for myself. Yes, I see some key opportunities here for us as a private public sector and all the stakeholders to get a focused plan together so that we can improve the situation so that South Africa can emerge from this in a very, very positive way. We know what the situation is. It's well-defined. It's well-classified. Our job now execution and monitoring to ensure that we overcome the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Did, did you have anything else, Fred, or were you happy with your with your last bit, which was quite conclusive, but up to you? Yeah, no, I think I think between uh, 
Anthony and Hamanth, they've just kind of summed it up and, and, and it's really about that. It's about execution. Agreed. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, um, I agree. Now the, it's, it's time to, to, to execute. And I think in, our, in, in two weeks' time, we, we will have some of our chamber members who are part of the execution solutions uh, discussing their options uh, with us. And, um, and I think we'll be well over the recovery in, in KZN. I think the blue and green drop reports um, have been reasonably well digested. And um, it's, it's, it's been very well covered by, by the media. So I think, you know, uh, everybody is, is up to speed with the, the overall um, theme from that. And we need to pull our sleeves up and, and get stuck in. Thank you very much uh, for, for our guests. Thank you, Brigetti, for, for arranging and, and, and managing uh, behind the scenes there. And thank you for, for our viewers and participants and for the questions. We look forward to meeting with you again in, in a fortnight. Thank you and be safe.